All right, you're welcome back. It's still TV3 New Day. And it's another Monday. We're coming to you from the Osu Mall on the Osu Oxford Street. And the entire week, this is where we'll be coming to you from. Of course, a given opportunity for a lot more people to engage in conversations that happen on TV3 New Day. Now, I also mentioned about two weeks ago that TV3 was dedicated to ensuring women participation in politics and also in leadership positions. And we were also contributing our quota to ensuring that the Affirmative Action Bill is eventually passed. As a result, we have introduced what we call the Woman Factor, where we engage female aspirants and incumbents on various national issues, give them the opportunity to also tell us what the experiences have been like um, in politics. And today we have another female. She's an honorable, and she is the MP for Afram Plains North constituency. And she goes by the name Honorable Betty Crosby Mensah. And today we'll talk about, you know, what life has been like, her first term in office as MP, the fact that she beat about two or three men uh, to become Six. the MP in that particular constituency. What are some of the challenges and what does she think that the, uh, you know, the woman's role is in society as well? So, Honorable, good morning and thank you for joining us. Thank you very it's much, It's a new Bella. week and you look great, I you must say. You look wonderful yourself. So, first four years, basically, in Parliament. How has it been? Yes, Bella, thank you very much. And let me just say, I appreciate the opportunity given to women on this, your popular and great platform. Let me use this platform again to also congratulate my very own mother, His, Her Excellency Professor Nana Jin Upukwajiman, on her nomination as the first ever running mate of the largest political party in the country. I want to also say a big thank you to His Excellency John uh, Dramani Mahama for giving women, in fact, the affirmative action, a voice. Mm. She, he has really given us a voice. Because over the years, as you all know, government after government, we've been struggling and trying very hard to uh, pass the affirmative action bill mm. that seeks to empower and to promote gender equality in our society. Mm. Unfortunately, in fact, in the 2017 uh, budget statement and in the State of the Nation address, you realize that the president was very vocal about it. He mm. spoke about it. And we're all quite hopeful that by the end of at least 2018, the affirmative action bill would have come to pass. Mm. Unfortunately, to date, we haven't heard anything about it. So I am mostly impressed and I'm happy that His Excellency John Dramani Mahama has taken the lead in actually giving women that voice. Because I believe that come 2020 December, of course, Ghana is going to have the first ever vice president of the Republic of Ghana. Okay. And we women, of course, the 51.2% population of women in Ghana, we are very certain that if we really believe in the affirmative action activities, all the events that we have taken place there, sensitization, the mm. education, then this is the time for our voices to be heard by endorsing His Excellency John Dramani Mahama and his running mate, Her um, Excellency Professor Jane Nana Opukwajima. I'll Thank come back you. to my first question about your experience, but since you've started with this topic of uh, gender equality, the argument has been that we can never be equal um, you know, in various capacities. And so instead of fighting for equality, why don't we rather fight for inclusion to ensure that at least we get more women? The president did promise that he will definitely pass this bill before he is out of office. Don't you think that he's done well with appointments, um, you know, in various, um, you know, institutions, at least for now? You know, uh, Bella, what I want to say about it is, are you telling me that then we just promise the people of Ghana that we're going to pass it mm. by just looking at the inclusion? We are expecting that once the affirmative action bill is passed, it becomes a law mm. that mandates government after government to recruit a certain percentage of, you know, population, population. or the women into leadership positions. But so, we, can, we cannot course, write off the good work is, he's done. Currently, what is our situation? Minister, yes. uh, we have, you know, a number of them. We have had, uh, you know, government after government also doing same. We had uh, the NDC appointing the first ever uh, Speaker, Speaker of, of Parliament, Parliament being yes. a female. We've seen a lot of women also doing it but is that enough mm. when i started i said we have 51.2 percent of our population being women and of course if women are supposed to give an equal representation then of course if we are having less than 15 percent of members of parliament that is a 275 women in parliament being women then of course you will say that we are not fairly represented are women ready to step forward and take up these positions because again the other argument has been that it's available if you want to come contest and let's see, may the best person win. But you realize that a lot of women sort of shy away, especially from politics and from other leadership positions because of the criticisms that come with this. 
the labels that come with it as well. Don't you think that's probably the reason why we don't have as many women representing us as expected? Bella, uh, we have been in this environment for a very long time. And you, as a you know, a very renowned journalist, I'm Thank sure you that, for that yes, of <laughs> course, I'm sure uh, you agree with me that women have not given their space as we deserve, and you know, really have to. Um, we believe that uh, once the bill comes into being or becomes an act, mm. then of course the the system, the government, leadership, uh, institutions, ministries, departments are you know a force to really implement and make sure that women are given the opportunity. Mm. In fact, when you do uh, your little research into it, you realize that probably women do not avail themselves because of logistical lack of logistical support. Again, you look at in terms of um, our educational background, who, which people feel that probably a lot of women are not given the needed education to go into those sectors. Mm. The last but not the least that the research talked about is the confidence that women really have to go into such leadership positions. But we believe that when a woman, for instance, we have um, uh, Her Excellency, Nana, na, na, yeah. Professor, Pro of, are you telling but, me but, that but she's... But she's not Her Excellency yet. Soon, of course, soon she will be. She okay. will be. And so look at her, the caliber of person that she is. And probably she didn't have the resources to you know, avail herself to run for the presidency. Does it mean that we should not give her the opportunity to serve as the vice president or better still in future at another leadership uh, position? So when we say that women are not availing us, so that is why there has been the need for the law. Again, we feel that uh, over the years, uh, looking at our cultural and social you know, practices, mm -hmm. it hasn't really encouraged the women to really avail themselves. Gone were the days when women were seen as, you know, being the head of the kitchen. Yeah. We, there has been a lot of cultural discrimination against women. Mm. And we feel that, yes, there are a lot of um, potentials, untapped talent within women that once it's given the opportunity, of course, it, pro it promotes uh, gender equality, mm. as well as it plays some sort of fairness when we talk about democracy. Okay. What is democracy when women are, you know, less represented? Especially when we know that the larger population of uh, the, country the country are women. women. So indeed, I think that the best way to go, uh, the proponents of this affirmative action looked beyond some of these factors. They mm -hmm. knew that, of course, a president or a government can decide, but to what end? Mm. Because then if you, like you said, if it is not in the interest of the president, then of course we'll always be lacking behind. Exactly. So I think that there's a need for the affirmative action, whether women avail themselves, then we will make it a course okay. to ensure that women are properly educated, women are properly sensitized or rented so that when the opportunity presents themselves, they'll be ready to take it up. Is that why you went into politics and how did you gather the courage to go against these men in your constituency? Bella, uh, with me, I would say that uh, when women are going to politics mm. or are given the opportunity to lead, we bring diversity okay. and not just only that we allow the less privilege and the less, you know, the voices that are not heard to be heard. Uh, my constituency, the Kowa from Plains North, happens to be one of the very deprived constituencies. Having been born, bred, and lived there, mm. I felt there was a gap that we needed to bring out, let the general public. Sometimes I sit back and I say, even government after government, political parties are yet to understand constituencies such as my own, that mm. is the Afram Plains North constituency. And so it's, it actually will take people like myself to come out and let the public, the general public, government, you know, departments, agents, to know really that there are people who have been left behind for a very long time and that they are also citizens of this country. We pay our taxes duly. Uh, we contribute into mm -hmm. making this country what it is. Because, I mean, when you look at our GDP, it's interesting to know that the Koa Afram Plains North mm -hmm. happens to, uh, 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 in fact, produce a large sum of this smoke a from fish okay and it contributes to our it's a variable to our gdp okay and so if it is coming from a from planes then of course the every government or whatever institution will have to look at the people coming from a from place so yes the interest was really my passion towards my people okay the love i have for the people and i felt that as deprived as they were or as they are still uh, their voices needed to be heard so what have you been able to do so far because i can imagine how challenging it's been and the fact that just when we thought that things were going well, 2020 was hit with COVID-19 as well. What have you managed to be able to do for your people? Um, uh, Bella, I think before we went on air, we we're having some discussions. Yeah. I think um, there is an area that as a, as a people 
or the general public have not really looked into mm -hmm. in terms of the various duties, responsibilities of, of um, the three arms of government. Okay. When we talk about the executive, we talk about legislature, and we talk about the judiciary. Now, uh, coming back to your question, you realize that when we talk about a member of parliament, our core mandate mm -hmm. is legislation. Yeah. The core mandate of parliament is legislation. Now, we go back to other responsibilities as uh, fi financing, we go into representation, okay. and then the likes. Now, everybody, including the media space, they are so quick to look at when you talk about representation. And so that comes about your question. Yeah. What have, what you, have been you been able, able to, to do? do? What yeah. I have been able to do in my capacity as the MP of Afram Plains is to bring to light mm -hmm. the plight of the people of Afram Plains. Okay. To let the general public, the international communities know that the people of Afram Plains deserve better. We are citizens of this country. Now, we can go to um, uh, issues such as... Um, our road network, yeah. which the number of times, in fact, the, I have filed a question on the floor of parliament. Those are some of the tools mm -hmm. an MP can use to actually bring uh, 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 to the government the challenges in their constituency. And so I filed a number of questions in parliament mm -hmm. to bring to government's attention that look, Afron Plains North, which constitute about, um, when we talk about from a chi amount from mm -hmm. to Agodeke, that mm -hmm. is my space, okay. is about 82 kilometer stretch. And then you look at an MP's, uh, you know, quarterly, you know, common fund. Mm -hmm. And if you're giving me four years of that common fund, I cannot even construct two kilometers of that road. Okay. And so it gives you an idea that it is not the core mandate of the MP, but then to bring the challenge to light so that every government that is interested, and believe me, you, in the 2016 uh, manifesto of NDC, the front plain stretch of uh, road was actually mentioned, and I will believe that if the NDC had won election 2016, then definitely our road was going it, to be It, it doesn't very well change. It doesn't change anything yeah. because um, you make it sound as if so the NDC is concerned about some constituencies. So if you had won, then maybe you would have fixed those uh, problems. But the MPP also even did declare this year as the year of roads. Again, they did. But when you it was at thrown their, into this When you look array. at their manifesto, when you look at the budget statement, there was no where in the budget statement that indicated that they were interested in fixing the Afro But that's why you were there. You were supposed to lobby to I, ensure. I have, my, brother, my sister, uh -huh. I have. As, as I already said, I said I have filed a number of questions on the floor. How far has that gone? Of course, it hasn't, you know, seen the light of day. Is it because you're <laughs> in the opposition? That is, you know, up to you and our I'm asking you, I mean, how to, do you feel about judge. it? Because you are the one in parliament and you understand the challenges that you face. Could it be because you're a woman or could it be because you are in the opposition party and so not much attention is paid to your I issues? Would, unfortunately, unfortunately for us in our situation, we are not, as a country, in fact, I wouldn't want to limit it. I would say, as a country, over the years, we have not looked at the total uh, concerns mm. and challenges of various constituencies. The government over the years have always focused on where their strongholds are or where they'll be maximizing their votes. And mm -hmm. so definitely, that's a challenge. So if you come to Koa Fram Plains North, where the MPP is making less than 3,000 votes, after election, then your guess is as good as mine why the government will be interested. But a government that is people-centered, a government that is interested in sharing our resources, that is redistribution of our resources equally, will not really regard, just as you know, you remember uh, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, mm -hmm. the enormous infrastructure he took to the Ashanti region, mm -hmm. irrespective of the fact that he knew that a lot of his votes were not coming there. But he felt the need there was that need for the people to benefit. So I felt that, you know, uh, uh, subsequently, any other government should be looking at it from that space. But unfortunately, that is not what we are experiencing. Mm. That is not what I am experiencing. Uh, in 2015, there was a, a bill that went into an act passed that is building a university satellite campus in my constituency. Unfortunately, when this government took reign, what happened is that the resources have been channeled to Bunsu, but your uh, people protested. We and did. But what happened again? To that? Government, I remember a comment from the minister when I filed a question mm -hmm. on the floor of parliament to the then minister for to the current minister of education. Mm -hmm. He said that Afram Plains North was inaccessible, and those were his exact words that it was inaccessible to benefit. And I asked, whose responsibility is it to make a community accessible? Mm -hmm. Is it the individual or is it the responsibility of the government? However, the then uh, NDC administration saw the need. Saw how the Volta Lake had 
really, uh, you know, divided or you separated. Know, exactly, yeah. you know, mm. uh, uh, taking the people uh, from plains people from mm. the, you know, the central, I'll say, uh, system. Yeah. And so they saw the need that once a front plains has been broken off as a result of the construction, let me put this clear, as a result of the construction of the Akosomo Dam, of course, of which we are all currently are all benefiting. benefiting. Exactly. And yet the people of Afram Plains, because we were so benevolent, we didn't complain, we've been cut off, mm. and uh, resources, infrastructure are being denied. So we will continue to believe that once uh, the NDC had plans, and they had already stated it, we believe that once the NDC come back into power, then of course what is duly ours will be given to the people of our family. You're also very concerned about child trafficking and child labor. Tell me why, because I read a comment you made and in there you said, I wish I could find it and read, but in there basically what you said was that we shouldn't necessarily criminalize the issue of child labor and trafficking, um, you know, because it's an opportunity for parents to also pass on some knowledge to their children in the field of work. What, under what context or in what context did you make that statement, especially knowing that we are all preaching the agenda for more children to be educated? Why did you make that statement? Uh, Bella, let me, let me thank you once again. Uh, this is a topic or a subject that is so dear to my heart. And uh, so giving me the opportunity to use your platform to really uh, expatiate on the subject matter is most appreciated. Now, um, I want us to go back to what research is saying. Okay. Uh, currently in our, in our system, we have uh, three out of four children living within poverty, the lowest poverty mm -hmm. in our system. Mm -hmm. That means over 73 percent of the children of the Republic of Ghana live in object poverty. Okay. And so just think about it. Now quickly, in Accra, in Kumasi, in our urban cities, you don't see our civil society organization, you know, rescuing children who are on the road or on our streets selling. We are not rescuing children who are on our street begging for arms. We are not rescuing children who are being molested. But how do we rescue homes. them when we don't have the uh, capacity? Okay, we don't. And yet quickly, every NGO, every civil society is quick to rush to my constituency, which is around the water lake, to rescue children in the name of trafficking. Now, the issue I want to bring out is that are we losing sight of certain cultural practices that has benefited us as a people over the years? Because probably we, are, we might not be as rich as the United States uh, of America. We might not be as resourced as the, you know, the yeah, United Kingdom. Countries, yeah. But yet, we had certain cultural practices that protected our families, that helped us to pass our wealth onto our children, our skills onto our children. Mm. Are, we, are we losing those, you know, uh, uh, attributes mm -hmm. or by just going by what the international standard is? Probably, like I said, that is why I'm in Parliament, mm -hmm. to bring some of these challenges so that even if there is a need for us to amend the children's rights, okay. then we need to do that. Because you realize that instead of us protecting our children, we are rather criminalizing their parents. And so the parents do not have any option, allow their children to go. And you know the interesting thing, when these NGOs rescue their children, where do they take them? Mm. We do not even have shelters in this country. Shelters that are being... We do not have adequate. We Let's, don't. Mm. And the ones that are being patronized by government currently are privately owned mm. with an interest to make a gain. You can't, you can't generalize because not all of them are in there to make gains. I have my... Some genuinely you know, want to um, help. Bella, it is my people, my children, that are being rescued supposedly over the years mm. and so i have taken the opportunity to really understand what these people go through i asked these ngos whether they have taken their the pain to even uh, interact with the stakeholders mm -hmm. to really understand what is the best practice now if you go to community like agala Kope to go and rescue children where there are no schools mm. even within the time of COVID, where schools are all closed down and you go and you rescue the children because you believe that the parents are taking their children to the lake. What good is there? Has government also, you know, uh, 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 played his role, mm -hmm. you know, by providing basic education, by providing teachers mm -hmm. to this community so that we do not seem as neglecting our children or better still involving our children as adults. Is it only just about providing these, uh, you know, facilities or more about sensitizing the parents? Because there are communities that may have schools, but there are still parents who are adamant 
in allowing their kids to go to school when they should be helping them on the lake or in the farm or wherever because at the end of the day they all make the money to take care of the children anyway. Bella, the argument when as a stakeholder I had the opportunity to interact with the families is that they felt that uh, teaching the child fishing is a way of giving them a trade, teaching them a trade. Okay. Just like you can take your ward or your child and given a, a special carpentry skills mm -hmm. or you know the other way around. But, but so that's they felt not, that that's not that's not the time the children should be learning a trade. You know, uh, Bella, have you been watching uh, America Has Talent? Uh -huh. you, you have the opportunity. But to that watch it. is promoting their talents. Yeah. No. No, that is growing their talent. Can, can, it's I, can, from I, can I finish? Forcing a child. Wait, can I finish? Hold the on, law before says I go on, I'm just the saying child that. should not be used for hazardous duties. But we so all understand what happens when these children are sent to the Good. lake. They're made so to when dive a, in. When you say America has talent. A parent puts her five year old child in the palm displaying. Is that not hazardous? What is your definition of hazardous? We're talking about talent and honing your talent here. And so now you that, think that the system child... there identifies their talent and hones it. In this part of the world, unfortunately, we're still grappling with parents even identifying what their children's talents are. And even when they do, they insist that, I'm sorry, I'm not going to let you do this because I think you should become a doctor, you should become a teacher, or you should join me in the farm. Bella, you know, I think that we are over-emphasizing on what is happening outside the world. Instead but you of brought that in. Yes, That's why I just I gave used that, that as an example. Instead of focusing on our strength as a people. Which is? Which is harnessing the potentials of our children within our local context. Within our local context, mm. those things you watch on TV, it is what the Americans think is talent. What do we think is talent? Mm -hmm. Right now, as I sit here with you, probably if we put you in a swimming pool without a, a swimming guard, you would get drowned, mm. wouldn't you? Yeah. However, those children have been trained properly. But is that their interest? That is not. That might not be their interest. Exactly. And hold on, that is why it is a process. Now we are asking that once government gives the needed, you know, amenities like you know infrastructure, schools teachers then the child can go back to school within a vacation or a school break then the child can help their their parent and so along the line if the child feels that oh this is a trade that i really want to go into then we can do that would that and not be too late because i already would have you know been involved in some trade or no, the other because we have never given the child an alternative like okay. i said you said it is not a talent it is not an alternative and so what is the alternative the child should go to school right mm -hmm. where is the infrastructure Okay, Why so then we'll talk about that and sensitizing so that parents well, as well. No. But government was saying that they were going to introduce foster homes at a point so that some of these rescued children would now have proper families to grow up in. That is an effort that government is making, I, no? I, I, you know, I will not uh, reduce the, you know, some of the nice probably ideas that government want to bring on board. But I feel that as a people, we should look at it holistically. Okay. We should sit down, Georgia, how many foster parents have been maltreating other people's children in their homes? How are we inspecting those homes and checking and making sure that these children are properly taken care of? Were you not in this country when children, resources that were sent to Osu children's home were being abused mm -hmm. when children in those two children's home were being we abused. Generalize no, because we sister. identify so I'm some saying, of these what problems. I'm saying is that this is a conversation that we should have. Okay. Because instead of doing that, what we are currently doing is to criminalize these poor families that who, who have the mentality of just passing on a trade to their children. If we feel like trokoshi, we feel that it's outmoded. Mm -hmm. How, why don't we modernize it? Why don't we bring some sort of, you know, modernization into the system okay. so that people can really understand what they are doing and whilst we prepare adequately for that child. I think this is a conversation we should be having. Okay. But we shouldn't start from the very end by, you know, arresting these children, not knowing where we are even taking these children mm. in the first place. I think it's an issue of concern. My time is up, but quickly, just because you're representing your constituency, I think that it's fair if they're watching you that you give them a message, especially looking at what your chances may be in the 2020 election. So go ahead and do that before we wrap up. Yes, um, thank you very much once again. Uh, wonderful people of Afram Plains. The love is deep, the love is big, the love is strong. Uh, I'm always committed to really help uh, bring our various challenges to light. Let government, let civil society, let people who are interested in the well-being of the underprivileged in the society uh, take care of. Uh, again, like I promised, uh, education infrastructure has always been a challenge. 
over the last three years, we have managed to start 17 pavilions, educational pavilions, that we believe that will give that child the opportunity to enroll in education. Again, we are still also building some chip compounds. I know we have three chip compounds that were left by the current government unattended to. Yes, I've just uh, secured some funds to ensure that the Abu Tansu chip compound is completed, Fasu Bato chip compound is completed. Again, at this moment, I'm just using Bella's platform, TV3 platform, to appeal to government that the people of Afran Plains still deserves better. Three years and going, we have not witnessed one single project within your administration, within Afran Plains North constituency. And I think that is an indictment on this government and the administration of the MPP. And so left with the four months to go, we are still calling on you government to turn your focus to the people of Afran Plains. If nothing at all, we have over 50,000 votes that are still standing. And so if you are interested, come fix our road. Thank you very much. I see. And all the best. We'll be waiting to see uh, what happens December 2020. Yeah. I hope you are Thank prepared you. for that. For but battle. it's been a pleasure speaking to you. I yes. wish we could go on for now. There's so much we could have talked about concerning women especially. But um, it's been an insightful interview. And so we've been speaking to Betty Crosby Mentor, Honorable Betty Crosby Mentor. She's the NDC MP for Afran Plains North constituency. And this segment we call The Woman Factor. It comes your way every Monday on TV3 New Day and this is our contribution in ensuring that the affirmative action bill is passed hopefully soon and if not we still um, you know engage as many women who are interested in leadership positions and also uh, in politics to come out speak about the challenges the benefits of being in uh, such positions so that we can encourage more women like you to also take up those positions like uh, ex-president Barack Obama says the woman is a better manager uh, of affairs. You know than... <laughs> but anyways, there's a conversation coming up about that 90-year-old man that was lynched in, um, you know, Gonja. And of course, Etonam will be having that conversation and a lot more. So look forward to it. This is TV3 New Day.